Well, welcome back. There have been hundreds of books and thousands of articles written about what caused the Civil War. We've not found one of them that has given the real reason. Now, what makes us think that we're so knowledgeable that we have the answer when others do not? Quite simply, we understand the conspiracy and their methods and why they targeted the United States. The United States had to be changed from its constitutionally limited form of government. It could not be allowed to set the example for the rest of the world, since the plan was to form a one-world government under the Illuminist leaders. The United States had to be brought under their control and then used to unite the rest of the world into their orbit. Now, I believe that all of the books and articles written about what caused the Civil War are correct in their limited way, but they're lacking the chain that links them all together. Now, what do I mean by that? It goes back to the Illuminati and how Marx and Engels showed in the Communist Manifesto that the intent was to subvert society as the basis for changing a country and installing a totalitarian state. The insiders knew that the greatest catalyst for change was war. The greatest level of change comes if the war is on the soil of the targeted country. There was no possibility of a war on American soil after the War of 1812, simply because the United States after the War of 1812 became so powerful that to invade us would have meant an ignominious de defeat. So that meant that a civil war had to be engineered. And this is what happened. Organization after organization, movement after movement, all controlled by descendants of the original Illuminists, both in the North and the South, created the condition for irresolvable differences. One of the key means for doing this was the movement for the abolition of slavery. Another was economic differences, since the basis of the economy for the two sections of the country were different. One was evolving more and more into an industrial base, and the other remained more agricultural. And there were other differences, such as the flow of immigrants. They tended to stay in the northern regions. In each movement, the strategy was to make the solution so intolerable that they could only, be, only make matters worse. In addition, the tactics used were designed to make one side defend things that were indefensible and boxed people in rather than bringing them together. For example, let us say that everyone knows that littering is wrong. If someone strolling along the street subconsciously casts aside a small piece of litter and is immediately accosted by an obnoxious individual who starts screaming at them to pick it up and why are they destroying the environment, what would be the reaction of the litterer? It would vary, but one thing we do know, they would not be in a very good mood and would act accordingly based on their personality. Then, and in the future, toward the other individual. It might even lead to violence. And this is the manner in which so much of the political and economic differences were handled. We see the same thing happening again in our time, aren't we? Let us begin by concentrating on one issue. Almost all Americans, both in the North and the South, knew that slavery was wrong but they were in a dilemma, a dilemma over how to eliminate it. Laws were passed soon after the founding of the United States against the importation of slaves and organizations were being formed to find some remedy compatible with all parties and progress was being made in the hearts and minds of all Americans. The English, meanwhile, had found a peaceful solution to their slavery. But the conspiracy was not going to allow a peaceful solution in America. They needed and used the issue for their own ends to help foster a war. Now, the most notorious leader of the abolitionists was a man by the name of William Lloyd Garrison. There were two prime examples of his motivation. One, he openly hated the Constitution. He was not interested in amending it to abolish slavery. He wanted it destroyed. You can imagine the reaction of the people who may have wanted to abolish slavery but loved the Constitution. They started to resist the abolitionist movement as a result. Oh, there were other outrageous acts as well that reacted the people, polarized them, and exasperated any idea of a, police, a peaceful solution. Second, 
The original masthead of Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, told the story of Garrison's true intent. The banner slogan said, Our country is the world. Our countrymen are mankind. In other words, Garrison was part of the Illuminist program for a one-world government. Soon, while the masthead was too revealing of Garrison's motivation to those who understood what was going on, their motto became even worse. The Constitution is a league with death and a covenant with hell. It had been only 25 years since the Jacobin agitation in America, and there was growing Carbonari influence that stood for the same things, one world government and abolishing the Constitution. Garrison, American socialists, and British agents helped found the American anti-slavery organization. It became quite radical and supported all manner of socialist initiatives as much as it did the abolition of slavery. Garrison was also active in peace societies, promoting internationalism and a one world government as a means to ensure world peace. Let us wrap up this segment by giving a rundown on Garrison since he was the linchpin of most of the organizations at the time that supposedly wanted to abolish slavery. William Lloyd Garrison played a dominant role in creating the condition of dividing the people over the issue of slavery. He was always in the leadership role in abolition, either out front or later behind the scenes when his reputation got too notorious. He started out in the temperance movement and then moved into abolition. In 1830, he became a perfectionist, the communist church at the time. He founded the Liberator, his, his uh, newspaper, in, ja in July of 1831, whose masthead supported the world system. He called for the disunion of the North and South as early as 1843. He publicly burned the Constitution in the streets of Boston in 1854. His associates actually said that the slaves had the right to cut the throats of their masters. His actions and calls for sedition and murder caused such a reaction that several states had rewards for his arrest. Garrison was not alone. There were many notable people in the North who supported him and did even worse things. At the same time in the South, conspirators were stirring up the people in opposition to such people as Garrison. In other words, the people by and large understood that slavery had to end, but were unwilling to take the rest of the solutions offered by the diehards, the dissolution of the country and the scrapping of the Constitution. The stage was being set for secession and war. Next week, we will demonstrate how the American people were reacted by terrorism into supporting the secession movement and civil war. Until next week, we'll see you then.